GLUT1 deficiency is what I would like to think of as the quintessential example of a rare disease. And so when you find a rare disease, often it might be the first case, or it might be the first two cases, and then maybe somebody else will find a third case. And over the first year or decade even, you may go from the first case to maybe 10 cases or even 100 cases, but it's still rare as such. And one of the issues is how common is it? How many people have GLUT1 deficiency in this case, uh, and how representative are they of the whole group? How common is it, or what we call how prevalent is it? And we talk about point prevalence. So in the world right now, how many cases are there of uh, GLUT1 deficiency? So that would be the point prevalence of GLUT1 in the world, or in England, or in the United States. And, since I come from the United States, uh, I often think about it in terms of the United States population. We have about 325 million people in the United States, and the question is how prevalent is GLUT1 deficiency? And we don't have good information right now. We can talk about the number of cases we've seen number of cases other people say, how many cases have been reported in the literature. But that is a very crude uh, assessment of how many cases there truly are. And the only way we'll ultimately get to that kind of information is really to do newborn screening and screen every baby born. Now in the United States, we have about four million babies each year born in the United States. And if we could test the blood spot on each and every one of those four million for something like GLUT1 deficiency, then we can come up with a very accurate birth incidence of GLUT1 deficiency, and then calculate that according to every year thereafter, assuming that everybody with the disease continues to live, we could come up with a reasonable estimate of the point prevalence in the whole population. But we're far from that at this point in time. So we, we uh, collaborated with some colleagues in Australia several years ago and came up with an estimate of GLUT1 deficiency in a province, Queensland province in Australia, where Brisbane, Australia is located, and we kept, came up with a prevalence of approximately one in 90,000 people. Number one, always true with rare diseases. Most physicians don't know about rare diseases. In our country, the National Institutes of Health estimate that we have more than 7,000 rare diseases. I mean, that's, that's a tremendous number. No physician knows about all 7,000 rare diseases or more. I mean, every week there's a new rare disease because of the emphasis now on precision medicine and understanding the genetic basis for diseases. And we define in our country a rare disease as a condition that affects less than 200,000 people as a point prevalence in our country of 325 million people as such. So that allows us to say there are more than 7,000 rare diseases that we deal with in the United States. Now that may be one patient, or it might be nearly 200,000 patients in the United States. But on average, it's about 4,000 people have one of the 7,000 rare diseases. And 4,000 times 7,000 is 28 million people. That's almost 10% of our population. 10% of the people in the United States have a rare disease of one kind or another. So in the aggregate, it's a big number. And from arguing for more support and more investigation and so forth, it's good to get the whole community of rare diseases speaking with one voice. And then we can learn certain things that apply across the board, not for just one rare disease, but for many rare diseases. So one important thing is to increase the capacity to recognize these problems early on.
gene therapy now has become a very realistic, uh, likely possibility after a difficult period in the 80s, 1980s, when gene therapy ran into some great difficulties. A patient died in the course of a gene therapy study and so forth, and it really kind of squashed the whole initiative for about a decade until we discovered a new particle, viral particle, called an adeno-associated virus, AAV. And I like to think of the viruses here as analogous to the Trojan horse story. So the Trojan horse is opened in the old uh, story of, of the past. The soldiers get into the Trojan horse. They sit them out in front of the gate. The people inside the gate think this is a gift from their people who are trying to attack them. At night, they open the gate, bring the Trojan host inside, close the gate, go to sleep. Then they open the gate and the Trojan horse, the soldiers come out of the Trojan horse. So here we have the same principle with gene therapy. We take the adeno-associated virus. We put a good GLUT1 gene into the adeno-associated virus. The adeno-associated virus goes into the cell goes through the cytoplasm into the nucleus and sets up housekeeping right next to all the genes. It's not integrated into our genome, but sits beside it and makes one gene product, the GLUT1 protein, which comes back out, gets inserted into the membrane, and now replaces the mutated or defective protein. And now we've restored the health to the cell. So now you can transport glucose from the outside to the inside of the cell with the gene therapy. And so it's one time and you're done. One treatment, you restore the GLUT1 protein in all the cells, particularly the brain cells, and then now you've effectively treated the patient completely, and then they can continue on without any further treatment being necessary. That would be a wonderful thing. I've been practicing medicine now, I hate to tell you this, but almost 60 years. And I've gone to a lot of conferences, most of which are scientific, professional neurological conferences, neuroscience conferences, pediatric conferences, and they're all terrific. And the focus is professional, scientific, academic in nature. The one thing that's lacking is the input from the patients and their families. And, you know, nobody knows the disease that we're talking about better than the patients that have it or the families who take care of the patient. They're living with this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I have the privilege of interacting with these people periodically, at the most once a month, or every three months, or every six months, maybe for 30 minutes, maybe for 60 minutes, maybe for a little longer if they're hospitalized and so forth. So these conferences give me a chance to learn from them because they know something about this disease that I don't know anything about. They've lived with it. They know what it's like to have this problem. And I listen very carefully because I want to learn from them. They want to learn from me, so it's a two-way street. So I'm trying to tell them as much as I can about the condition they have, and they're trying to tell me what it's like to live with the condition they have as such. So these meetings, like the one we're at here today with Matthew's friends and the GLUT1 Foundation people and so forth, are very instructive and I think much more meaningful because we can create a partnership here. We all have the same goal in mind. We want to get rid of this disease. Mm -hmm.